Hello, and welcome to episode five of the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman, and the theme for today's episode is the humble hat. So you may have noticed that I like to wear hats. Got another one on today. I found this one um, a little while ago. I made this uh, probably a few months ago, and um, it's just a little design that I made up. It's um, it's kind of cool. You you basically knit this flap a little longer. It's going to be kind of hard to see in this light, but um, you make a little flap that's longer and then kind of fold it up and button it. And then there's a little ribbed section here, and it's knit in uh, creatively dyed yarn. It's not quite as uh, not quite as saturated as it's showing up on my camera, but um, I haven't written up the pattern yet. I'll do it someday, I suppose. Um, but I like the hat, and I found this. I found this button at a um, a local button shop or fabric store that actually closed down not too long ago, which is really sad because they had the best, the best buttons. But it's, I guess it's kind of my nod to a cloche hat. I kind of love those. So hats. I love them. And um, I was I had the occasion to think about them again recently, uh, kind of more deliberately, I guess, because uh, I was sent a review copy of a book called She Makes Hats that is being published by a small independent publisher called Asymmetrical Press. And uh, and I read through the book and I just thought she had some some really interesting things to say about why knitting hats can be uh therapeutic and important and useful and you know all kinds of things it's a it's an interesting reflective book and so I thought I would talk about it a little bit today and about what there is to love about the knitting of hats so I will um and actually before I get to that I want to talk about a few things that are kind of threads of discussion that have gone on about some of the stuff that I've brought up in previous episodes that I thought has been really interesting and I wanted to share with you and um, so I'll do that first, talk about a little bit about the She Makes Hats book and Hats book and some of the really interesting things that she uh, brings up about hats and why they're interesting to knit. And, um, and then I wanted to show you some of my, uh, kind of point you towards some of my favorite hat designers, some of which you may have come across before and some of which you might not have, um, as you've probably figured out by now if you've been watching the podcast. I don't exactly have um, mainstream tastes, <laughs> so I thought I would just, you know, kind of share with you who some of my favorite hat designers are. And um, and then as as always, I'll have a technique segment at the end. And this time, I thought I would show you how to do Emily Ocker's cast on, which is a great way to um, if you're if you're starting, say, at the top of a hat, if you want to work a hat from the top down. Uh, it's a really good cast on that lets you just kind of start with a few stitches and seal it all up so that it's virtually invisible, the beginning of the hat. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And before we before we get into anything, just a couple of announcements. One of them is that I really want to thank, uh, there are three of you who have, um, well actually six of you who have gone into iTunes and uh, and left ratings for the podcast, which I really appreciate you taking the time to do. It was really kind of you, and um, it just helps other people find the podcast, and so thank you for doing that. And there are three of you, three of those six people actually left uh, reviews of the podcast there, and I want to thank you for doing that as well. Uh, Morgan in Cali, DV12, and I hope I'm saying this right, J Knight, that's me, all left reviews of the podcast, and, um, and we're very kind in what you said. So thank you for, for doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, I also wanted to, another sort of thing that's, um, you know, happened off podcast that I thought was really fun was that, uh, if you remember last time, my technique segment, I talked about, um, I showed you how to do, how to cable, work cables without a cable needle. And, um, and what I thought was really cool was that somebody, uh, her name's Sarah Hep, or yeah, Sarah, she's S. E. Hepworth on Ravelry, came and posted a picture of a hat that she knitted, um, having used that tutorial to do the cables. So she worked the whole. It was a cabled hat, and she worked all the cables without a cable needle. So I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> I mean, you kind of hope people will use these things, but it's just really great to to see an actual example of it. So if you want to see that. 
uh, go to Ravelry, look for the Dark Matter Knits fans group. And in the discussion thread for episode four, she's got a picture of the hat. It's really cute. It's a uh, it's done in self striping yarn, which just looks great with with cables. Um, another follow up from a previous episode. In fact, I think this is also from from the last episode. I had talked about whoa 3D. I had talked about this book last time, Unexpected Knitting, and um, it turns out that when I hold these things up, they do get turned around. <laughs> I thought that see when I look at when I look at what's being recorded on screen it's all backwards it turns out it does get mirrored for the final video so you can read this unexpected knitting so uh, this is a book I talked about last time uh, by Debbie new it came out in 2003 from schoolhouse press so it's more than a decade old now it's an amazing book and I was talking about this in the context of trying things with your knitting that are well unexpected you know that are outside the mainstream and um, a couple of people had said in the discussion thread for this for this episode on Ravelry that they would really that there's really not a good preview of the book online Amazon doesn't have a good preview uh, not many projects have been posted from this book probably because it um, well for two reasons probably one of them is that the book predates Ravelry and um, you know so people don't tend to post date or post if they they might have knitted it before Ravelry came into existence, in which case they wouldn't necessarily put a picture of their project up on Ravelry. Um, but it's I think it's also because a lot of the knitting in this book is really unusual, and um, in some ways this book functions just as well, or even better, as a coffee table book and inspiration than as an actual pattern book. But it is that too. So I just wanted to show you, by way of you know kind of helping you decide whether you want to add this to your own library or not. And just to give you some inspiration, um, what kinds of things she does in here. So it's a huge book, as you can probably see. I mean, it really is kind of coffee table sized, and it's it's hardback. It's a pretty thick book. There are lots of gorgeous pictures in here, uh, lots of detailed pictures. And um, she's got, uh, in the table of contents, you can see she talks about all different kinds of ways of literally taking your knitting in new directions. You know, how to go off the regular grid of working fabric back and forth around and round. And um, so she starts with what she calls swatchless knitting, which is just picking up, picking up a, a ball of yarn and some needles and getting going on a project, a garment even. She's got a couple of, of sweater patterns in here without swatching. Um, you know, in other words, how to kind of make it happen as you go. Um, she's used a lot of log cabin kind of techniques in that chapter. And there's uh, a chapter on freeform knitting, on scribble lace, and you know, all kinds of ways of just going in unexpected directions. So let me show you some examples of this, because it's kind of hard to describe in the abstract what she's doing. But for example, one of the things that she does is she has done these amazing mosaic kind of knitted art pieces and you can see the scale of this is massive each one of those squares is a a square of um oh, what do you call it when you do oh my gosh mitered knitting um or is it log cabin let's take a closer look there's a, a detailed shot in here oh, okay it's actually neither it's just well some of it's mitered so there, here's an extreme close-up. And then you can, here's a kind of medium distance view of what she's done. Isn't that amazing? I love that. And there, it looks like it's all undyed yarn and she's just, you know, probably mapped it out square by square to try to figure out how to get this overall effect from basically knitted strips. And there are a lot of these just golly gee whiz sort of pieces. This is from the chapter on freeform knitting, where she's basically knitted a piece of stained glass by um, by basically adding on pieces one at a time. You know, starting from, let's say she started here with the head, building it out from the center, and then building the halo out from the center of that, and then picking up stitches along here to start this. Um, 
I mean, it's really, I love this idea of thinking about, of approaching knitting as a, as a fine art, basically. And she even tells you, she gives you techniques for how to pick up stitches in lots of different kinds of spaces so that you can, in freeform knitting, so that you can go off in any direction that you choose. And here's another, here's a more kind of garment example of how you can use freeform knitting. Again, looks very much like stained glass, just gorgeous. And you can imagine how you could use, I mean, especially for, for using uh, stash yarn, you could really uh, do just about anything with the yarn that you already have. And not even plan it ahead of time. You know, you could just kind of experiment and see where it goes. And um, she also does this really cool, I believe she came up with this technique uh, of scribble lace, where she takes a very fine yarn and you almost can't even see it. It's what's forming the fabric, the very gauzy fabric in between those scribbles of thicker yarn. And she makes these beautiful shawls out of it. Um, she even made herself a gown with it. Um, a lot of the people who are in this book modeling these pieces are, are family members. The scribble knitting stuff is beautiful and you know she just she'll use knitting to make anything. This is my favorite. I ga actually gasped when I saw this in the book. Um, okay that's just beautiful on its own. You think oh what a lovely shawl. I mean look at that. Just a you know, an amazing piece of engineering for one thing, to be able to put all those pieces together into a well-balanced whole. But then, it's not a shawl. Oh no! It's a boat! <laughs> Shut up! She knit a boat! Okay, so what she did was, she knitted this giant, you know, hat, basically, made a, a huge bowl, and, um, and then filled it with resin, I think. And um, she describes how she made it in the book. So you can reproduce it too if you want. And um, so you, yeah, you can paddle it across the lake. You know? I love, I love this woman. Um, so, the, I mean, the pieces are everything from, you know, just totally off the wall um, and, but, and also beautiful art pieces to very wearable type stuff. And um, so here's, you know, one of the more kind of pragmatic pieces. This, these are sideways socks. And the, this kind of thing has been um, reproduced a number of times since, but I believe that she was the first, if not one of the first, to come up with this idea of, you know, knitting socks in this direction instead of, you know, starting at the cuff or starting at the toe. And they, you know, make really cute little... <laughs> little baby socks. Um, get to the next little tab here. She pl loves playing with knitting as sculpture. There are actually, there is no, there's not an actual teacup inside here that is entirely knitted with nothing holding it up. She's just knitted it in such a way that the sculpted nature of the knitting holds it up. Aren't they beautiful? I mean, look at that. It looks like actual china. Ugh, this woman is amazing. And one of my favorite things that she shows you how to do is how to, um, let me describe this first so you know what you're looking at, how to take canvas, like a, real, a kind of thin gauzy canvas, and use a needle and yarn to uh, kind of Kitchener on, or duplicate stitch, fake knitting, onto the canvas so that you can go in any direction that you want. Um, so she shows you here how to do it. And then I'll show you, show you an example of what you can then do with it. Um, so here she's, you know, she, she's got the canvas in the background so that you can take the knitting in any direction. And then she makes this vest out of it and see how they're little the darkest spots are actually people doing little somersaults all over the place. So you can cut the canvas into any shape you want, into the vest, and then just make these sort of fake knit stitches on top of it into any shapes that you like. It's really cool. 
So you don't actually use knitting needles, you just use a tapestry needle. And last thing, oh my gosh, this piece, <laughs> so cool. If you like puzzles and all, this will thrill you to no end. Um, this is a, what does she call this? The Sum Assembly Necessary Sweater. And this is what she calls labyrinth knitting. So you, you knit this one long strip with, um, you know, with different mitered corners and it all goes together. See the boy in the last picture? On the ground is it before it's sewn together and then he's wearing a finished labyrinth sweater. Oh, just the, I am fascinated by the kind of mind that comes up with these things and it, I find it really, really inspirational. So Unexpected Knitting, Debbie New, you can find it from Schoolhouse Press. I believe it's on some of the, you know, the bigger book sales sites as well, but Schoolhouse Press sells it directly and you gotta love them. That's, whoa, extreme close-up. Um, that's Meg Swanson and um, a bunch of wonderful people in the knitting world. Okay, so that's, that's unexpected knitting. Now I wanna talk about, um, like I said, another book that I've been looking at recently. And I, I don't really wanna do a traditional book review in this sense. Um, but like I said, a, a press called Asymmetrical Press, another independent press, sent me this book. And it's actually not out yet. Uh, I imagine it's going to be published pretty soon. It looks like it's in a pretty finished state. Uh, but the book is written by Robin Devine. Um, her, la her name is spelled R-O-B-Y-N-D-E-V-I-N-E. -E. And as always, I'll put all this information in the show notes as well. Uh, but she started a project a number of years ago, and she describes why she started doing this in the book uh, at a website called shemakeshats.com. And the idea was that she wanted to, she just loves to knit hats, cannot stop knitting hats. And as you can imagine, uh, you can pretty, pretty quickly run out of people to give hats to, even if you're giving them multiple hats. <laughs> you know, it's at some point, there's really nobody who needs hats anymore. So she realized that she just wanted to keep knitting hats, so they needed to go somewhere. So she started to think about, you know, where would be good places to give my finished hats to. So she makes them, you know, she makes preemie hats and gives them to hospitals and she makes hats for the homeless and she makes hats, which makes hats for all kinds of people, probably cancer patients, etc. And um, so she talks about, really the main point of the book is to talk about why she likes making hats and uh why giving hats to other people is so important to her. So I wanted to, to kind of share some of her thoughts with you because the, um, I think they're really Here's the cover of the book. Sorry about the glare from my window. Here you can see my backyard. <laughs> but you can also see this lovely woman and her adorable son um, on the cover of the book, obviously wearing one of her hats. So let me just, uh, I, I bookmarked a couple of places that I wanted to share with you that I thought were really interesting. Her son, unfortunately, does not like wearing her hats, which is just so sad. Um, but, uh, but obviously lots of other people do like wearing them. Um, so here's one of the things that she says is that uh, she talks about how, you know, as a young woman, as a younger woman, she's obviously still fairly young, um, that, you know, she had these very grand visions of what she was going to do with her life. And, you know, one of the things that kind of typically happens to you in your 30s and 40s is that you realize that uh, those grand visions that you had for yourself may not ever come to fruition, that the scale of your life is probably going to be more modest than you had thought it would be. As you can tell, I've, or, I've gone through this process myself. Perhaps you have too. I hope not. I hope your dreams were just as grand and that you have fulfilled all of them. Uh, and there's still time. But she says, I wish I could tell you there was some important event that changed my way of thinking. But the truth is, I've begun to slowly awaken to the idea of being useful to the realization that my life is, in fact, grand and important. Even if people all over the world don't know my name, and probably never will, my life is a life that matters. It is, strangely enough, in the smallest moments of life that I've caught a glimpse of importance and grandeur. 
which I thought was probably the most profound point from this book, is that, and she talks about how this ties in with the knitting of hats, that knitting a hat is, and especially the kind of very basic hats that she knits for for charitable organizations, it's not complicated. And if you've done them enough times, you can practically do them in your sleep, um, which is probably one of the reasons why people undervalue their their hand knit so much is that if you're making basic stuff it seems like nothing but uh there's a kind of achievable grace in creating something like that because the person who receives the hat is kept warm which is such a, a basic thing but there's but being kept warm in a literal sense is not necessarily something that everyone can take for granted um, you know, you think of, of preemies or, or homeless people, for example. Um, being warm is not necessarily something that comes easily. Uh, but also being kept warm in the, the more emotional sense that someone cared enough about me, at, at least in the abstract, to spend a considerable amount of time making this hat for me. And, um, and so she, she talks about how the realization that that simple act, the, the making of a simple hat and giving it to someone else, someone she will never meet, is, uh, helps her to feel important, like she's accomplishing something. Not anything earth-shattering, um, but important. And I think, you know, it's interesting. This is one of the, I mean, she's hit upon one of the very things that a lot of people say about social change is that, you know, a lot of times people uh, get so hung up on not being able to do anything pr profound or huge to, to change the world that they kind of stop, they kind of give up on changing the world at all. When in actuality, uh, you know, doing something small like that is significant. You think, for example, about, um, if you if you read the Yarn Harlots blog, one of the things that she has done over the years is to raise money for um, Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, which is an organization that uh, sends doctors throughout the world uh, to places that don't have regular medical care. And, uh, you know, no single person, I think for the most part, the people who have donated to her fundraising drives have given very small amounts of money, but um, but she's raised an enormous amount of money for this organization. I think it's some now it's it's over a million dollars now. I don't know what, exactly what the figure is anymore, but it's it keep, and it keeps climbing. And she made this really interesting point in her blog at some point where she was you know kind of astonished by the cumulative impact of the knitting community on this organization. And she said, you know, what I realized is that knitters understand more than anybody else the impact of a small gesture. That when you put enough small gestures together, you get a sock. <laughs> you know, it's just one knit stitch at a time. It kind of teaches us the patience to be able to realize that small gesture, small gesture, small gesture, all added up in the end, finally equals something, and something quite moving. So, um, you know, in an, interesting, in an interesting way, she raises this same point in, Robin Devine does, raises it in her book, and uh, with specifically about hats. Um, I wanted to share one other. Yeah, and she talks about you know some some difficult times that she has has gone through, and you know that the kind of rhythmic knitting of hats has helped helped her through those those times in some cases. And she she says kind of towards the end that it's projects like these knitting a, a very simple hat where I can turn my brain off for a time and work through the motions that have helped heal my heart. Something amazing happens when I knit. My love becomes something tangible. I guess that's from that might be from a different part of the book, but again, just this idea that um, you know the kind of regular repetition 
of a simple stitch over a simple, the construction of a simple pattern that you've done over and over again uh, can be therapeutic both internally and externally. And um, so it's, you know, if you like that idea of, you know, kind of thinking through the significance socially and therapeutically of, of knitting. I, I would recommend that you look at this book. It's it's really interesting. I will say that if you have um, struggled with having a child and are still struggling with that and it is upsetting to you, I will warn you that this book is going to trigger that. Uh, it's She has also struggled with this, but in the end you know, succeeded in, in having a child. And so if that, if reading about that process upsets you, then you might want to give this book a pass. Because I know that can be really, that can be really hard to read through again. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting book and, and well worth a read if those are topics that interest you. Um, so that's Robin Devine. She, she makes hats. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure I got the title of that right, because the blog is, is somewhat different. Okay, and uh, and I also, I said as I said, I wanted to, to share with you uh, some of my favorite hat designers as well, because one of the cool things about hats, I mean, it, you can make it very simply. I mean, this is actually a, a fairly simple hat with a few twists on it, but I love the way that hats can be a kind of basic canvas for trying out lots of different techniques and shapes and um, constructions and you know it's kind of a, a blank canvas and there are some people that I think have done some really fun things with that so I wanted to show you I'm gonna get my iPad back again show you some examples of that from uh, from my so own first person I want to talk taste. about is somebody that you perhaps haven't come across and I want to mention her because she does something really interesting with the hat, and that is to use it in more of a millinery kind of fashion. So millinery is, ba is basically the making of hats, but it's usually meant more like, um, you know, the kind of hats that you would wear to a royal wedding or, you know, a Southern Baptist church, <laughs> you know, like the fabric hats. And um, so this woman named Teresa Silver does these has done this book called Hat Couture that um, where she basically takes a knitted hat and either knits it really knits the fabric in such a tight fashion that it can actually be sculpted into a hat that looks more like millinery. So here is one example. This is called Marlene. This is the the cover hat from the book and she hasn't felted it what she's done is she's knit the the hat so as I said as I mentioned so tightly that um that it just stands up on its own and sometimes she'll put a canvas have you sew a canvas inside so that it'll be have a little more structure to it and then um, tells you how to sew ribbons and beads and so on onto the outside so they they kind of a lot of these look like uh, classic Hollywood starlet kind of styles. That's one of my favorites from the book. I want to show you another one of my favorites. It is, where are you? This one. There are a bunch of really cool hats in here, but this is another one that I think is, you know, the hat is actually very simple, but she does this cool thing where she takes a, shows you how to take silk and um, construct in a button and construct it into this giant fabulous bow that you then sew onto the side and I love it. the photography is fabulous isn't it full disclosure I laid out this book but it gave me a lot of time to study the pictures and just think how wonderful it was so that's Teresa Silver um, another one of my favorite people that uh, you know really takes the knitting of hats in literally in unexpected directions is Lee Meredith. And um, this name you may have come across before. Uh, her her name on Ravelry is Lethal Lethal, and she her brand is Lethal Knits. Here's one of my I'll favorites. Just kind of show you the hats of her. Well, now let me get one of them bigger because that's too small. Uh, but it's basically a hat that you 
that is knitted in multiple different directions and then all buttoned up together into this really cute hole. Oh, look, my son's Kung Fu class starts at 1.15. <laughs> I'm sure you really wanted to know that. <laughs> uh, so that's Lee Meredith and she just, I love her. You can just tell from her design page, the woman likes color. She is just a, has fabulously imaginative uses of, of color and shape. And another one in that vein, and, and this this woman is in some ways even better known and really focuses on, on hat design is Wooly Wormhead. But I have to show you her in case you've not come across her before. So yeah, she's she's designed 224 patterns and most of them are hats. So you're gonna find something that you like in here. And some of them are, you know, very uh, standard shaped hats. She does a lot of great hats for kids and for men um, that which you know can be sometimes a little hard to um, people that can be a little hard to to knit for. Um, but some of her hats have really unusual. I think this one's hilarious. So it's kind of a, a take on the on the ponytail hat. This is called igloo and uh, it's basically an ear flap hat that has a hole in the back that your dreads or your ponytail can come out. And um, this is my favorite picture of it. <laughs> Isn't that adorable? <laughs> so cute. And she's got another one that, uh, that appeared in Nitty that has uh, little tentacles coming out of it. Oh, here we go. Oh yeah, here it is, Hat of Horns. This is this one. Oh no, this is in the Anticraft. That's right, not a nitty. Um, but it's uh, she clearly just got fascinated with the idea of playing with shapes and um, decided to turn people into dinosaurs. <laughs> but you know, in the right mood, that would be the perfect hat for some days, wouldn't it? I just love that. Um, and I won't. Uh, I'm not going to drag this out by paging through Ravelry pages over and over again, but um, Alex Tinsley and Erica Joukowsky, I will also link them in the show notes, um, also do beautiful hats. Um, Erica Joukowsky also has some for, for men. Um, Alex may, ha may as well. Uh, but just, you can, you really could, as Robin Devine talks about in her book, you really could just knit hats for the rest of your life and explore every technique and shape imaginable. They're a very fun medium, as I say, for exploring lots of different avenues. Um, what have I been knitting this week? Well, I've been working pretty monogamously on something that I've been wanting to get done. Um, this is the... Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's just... I was hoping that since today was a little more overcast, that the lighting would be a little better, but this is still just make, looking kind of neon. Um, this isn't going to look like much until it's blocked, but you, I can just at least show you the progress that I've made. It's going to be a very shallow shawl, really more like a scarf, um, that has something of a shawl-ish shape, um, that I'm knitting with undead yarn. And, um, so it should be done, I'm hoping by the end of, by about a week from now, and then I can finish, uh, writing up the the pattern draft so I can get out to those of you who very kindly volunteered to um, to test knit the pattern and I really appreciate that those of you who got in touch with me I've um, got a number of test knitters now which is fabulous um, so I've been doing that and I got some stuff back on the spinning wheel <laughs> clack Okay, so this is uh, the fiber that I picked up at the retreat that I went to not too long ago. Um, the Wooden Spinner is the name of the of the uh, the fiber producer. She's based in Mississippi, and it's this fun um, bat with which is uh, merino with uh, silk noil, and um, which you can definitely see, and Angelina, which is a little harder to see. Uh, but it's really fun to spin. So fun to spin. It makes this um, 
the silk noil just kind of bloop, 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 like blurps into it's sort of like a you know like you're squeezing a thing of ketchup and all of a sudden something <laughs> just comes out uh, I just think it's really fun because you're kind of spinning along this consist fairly consistent fiber of the with the merino, and then um, just this little burp of silk noil comes in, and you've got to, you know, kind of figure out what to do with it. So, uh, you know, it's interesting for a control freak like me to just have to let it go, <laughs> let the blurp go in, and it kind of um, the merino kind of twists around the blurp a little bit so that it doesn't, it won't come loose too easily. So that has been really fun to work on too. Um, I think that is it as far as the the regular part of the show goes. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about technique stuff. Um, as I'm, I'm going to record that separately in just a minute and put it here at the end. So as always, you can uh, find me as uh, Elizabeth GM on Ravelry. There's a Dark Matter Knits group that you are most welcome to join there. We've already been having some some really interesting discussions and sharing of projects over there. And um, I now have a mailing list that you can find. Uh, you can find a link to subscribe there at darkmatterknits.com, which is my website. And um, if you'd like to follow me on on Twitter or Instagram, I'm Dark Matter Knits there. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, sorry, this was episode was a day late. It's just my son was on spring break this week, and it kind of disrupted everything. Um, but I will be back in a couple of weeks, hopefully this time on a Friday, and um, and I'll put the technique thing in here at the end. See you soon, hey everyone. Bye. I wanted to show you my version of Emily Ocker's circular cast on. This is one way of doing it that a number of people have tried. Uh, there are lots of different variations on this cast on. But basically the idea is that you want to get, it's for when you want to do something like a hat from the top down where you need to start with a small number of stitches and increase out to a larger number. Um, so it's basically, I'm going to do it with a crochet hook. There are tutorials online for how to do this with a knitting needle. Uh, if you look up Tin Can Knits tutorial on how to do this cast on, uh, you'll find that they do it with a knitting needle. I like to do it with a crochet hook because I just like to be able to have that hook to pull the loops through. So basically you're going to start with a loop, not a knot or a slip knot, but just a loop. And I'm going to have the tail over here to the right and my working yarn over here to the left. And I'm just crossing the working yarn over the top and having that come out to the left and the tail is underneath and coming out to the right. You just want to leave the standard, you know, four inch or so tail. With my left hand, I'm going to, actually I need to first get the, the yarn kind of wrapped, the working yarn wrapped around my pointer finger. And then with my middle finger and thumb, I'm just going to pinch that loop open. I just want it to stay in place while I do a few things here. Get a crochet hook that's about the right size for the yarn that you're using. And I'm just going to come through here, come down through that hole, that little loop I've made. You know, come at the, the working yarn from the left and underneath. And pull a loop through. Okay, so now I've just pulled a loop of yarn up through that original loop. This yarn is very sticky. So I've pulled a loop through and now I'm just going to go back and grab another loop and pull it through that loop I just made. And I'm going to repeat that several times. Go down through the original loop, pull a stitch through, grab another loop, and pull it through the first. So basically what I'm doing is I'm pulling a loop through here and then I'm pulling a loop through the new stitch I just made. And you can keep doing this until you've got I would say about six or eight stitches on your hook. And you can just kind of let them float back here along the hook. Okay, 
So now I've got six. And then you just grab your knitting needle. I just slide them all the way down to the tip of the crochet hook and slip them over onto my knitting needle. And you would actually need to have um, DPNs or if you're going to do magic loop, a very long circular, you're going to need something to get around a small circumference. But watch what happens. I just want to show you that once you get going, you can then pull on the tail, oops, and that hole closes right up. So once it's, you know, all in a circle, there's no, there's no gap there. It's just a cute little, little knot there at the beginning. So very clever little cast on anytime you need. This would be great for baby socks. I don't think I would recommend this for adult socks because it's not a particularly comfortable toe inside a shoe. But you could use this at the if you wanted to do top-down mittens. You could use this for a top-down hat. Anything where you need the top to be closed and um, and you want to, or you need the, the beginning to be closed and you want to increase your stitches from there. 